Hello, I'm Heather. And I'm Hannah, and we work for the environmental charity FIDRA. And today we're going to talk you through some of the processes and pitfalls of UK REACH. And we're specifically going to look at registering a chemical and also getting chemicals restricted. And UK REACH is the UK regulation that controls the chemicals that can go onto the UK market. So, if you are a company and you want to uh, get a chemical onto the UK market, you are supposed to supply some data to the regulator, so that is HSE, the Health and Safety Executive. And you're supposed to compile that data into a dossier that you then submit to HSE. HSE will assess the data and they may ask for more information. Once they've got all the information that they need, then the HSE can register that chemical for use in the UK and the chemical can enter into use. So that's how it's all supposed to work. At the moment, though, we don't have information about um, what data is actually required by the HSE. Um, and um, at the moment, there is no data on the chemicals on the UK market. So to compile these dossiers, um, you need some information about hazards and you also need some information about use and exposure. Um, some of the information about hazard should be um, the same no matter where you are in the world, it's inherent to the chemical. Um, and a lot of the data should already, ex already exist within EU reach. So this data is data that already exists. The problem is, is that that data um, is owned by companies and it can't necessarily be shared and given to HSE or given to companies that want to register a chemical for use in the UK. So that means that we have a few um, issues here with preparing these dossiers. So we have a lack of data that is able to be inputted, even though it already exists in the EU, but because it sits in companies, it's not able to be shared. Preparing these dossiers is also an expense. So it can make it difficult for industry can justify that expense to operate in the UK. Another of the issues is that although this data is supposed to flow through um, into the regulator, there is no data currently available about GB or UK use and exposure. That data hasn't been required before and it doesn't yet exist. Um, it is likely that HSE is going to require GB specific data on use and exposure rather than the data that already exists on EU use and exposure. So that means that there's another blockage um, into compiling these industry dossiers. So at the moment, we don't have any data available to HSE on the chemicals that are on the UK market at the moment that we brought over from the EU. So anything that used to be able to be used in the EU is currently allowed to be used here in the UK, but we don't have access to the data on that. So that means we have no data on chemicals on the UK market. Um, and this is a concern for regulators, um, but it's also a concern for all of us as consumers, as citizens, as people that care about the UK environment and wildlife, because it also impacts the restriction process. So the restriction process works on having a range of health and environmental concerns and these concerns should feed through into a number of restriction suggestions that come through to DEFRA. So DEFRA, um, the department of, um, in government that are responsible for the policy around this and DEFRA are, sort of, are then going through a process of looking at restriction suggestions that come in and prioritising them. But only two to five chemicals, or sometimes groups of chemicals, um, are being prioritised um, by DEFRA. And this is one of our concerns because these chemicals are 
potentially neurotoxic and how can you compare that against something that is toxic to reproduction? We don't think you should have to prioritise them. We need a system that is capable of looking at the breadth of chemicals that are on the market already and making decisions around whether they should be restricted, not on the basis of capacity, but on the basis of the um, need to restrict them and to stop the harm coming to people and wildlife. So only a very few chemicals make it through to the next stage, um, which is a restriction request coming through. And now this restriction request will then hopefully make it through to a restriction um, dossier. But we're finding that um, these restriction dossiers getting to this stage is taking some time. Once it does get to this stage, there are a series of further assessments and consultations um, and finally, a draft opinion and restriction um, is drawn up and a decision is made, final decision is made, and eventually we get um, a restriction coming into force. This restriction uh, could have a long, long sunset date, um, so the restriction could come into force after a, a number of years have passed to give time for industry to adapt. Um, but a dis from the point where a decision is made to a restriction has been first initiated it does have a timeline. So that's supposed to be two years. One of the issues we have is that the first start of the process has no deadline. And this can take um, as, long as, it, as long as it takes really. Um, and at the moment it's taking a very long time. That's because extra steps have been added in. So, for example, um, a restriction request was made for um, PFAS, a group of persistent chemicals, and an RMOA was suggested before a restriction dossier was drawn up. And that RMOA also had within it, so an RMOA is a risk management options analysis, the RMOA had within it calls for evidence. The RMOA has now been published and it has called for further studies. So that further study could then suggest that a restriction is drawn up. So we end up in this cycle where we have an ongoing loop of different um, calls for evidence, risk management options analysis, further studies, sometimes further risk studies are also suggested at this stage. Um, and potentially meaning that we're never progressing to the stage where a restriction actually happens. One of the other issues that we have is that many of these restriction processes have started calling for um, data on either GB use and exposure, which we don't have. So we've got no data that is able to inform any of these processes. So we can't identify it um, for the restriction suggestions, sometimes DEFRA, when they're prioritising, have said, oh, well, what about GB use? But we don't know and we don't have that data. Similarly, the, the um, RMOAs have some, sometimes called for this data and it's not there. As well as the restriction dossiers and the consultations calling for this data and it's just not there. So we're not seeing... Um, the data being available to use and we can't have a restriction process that is reliant on having that data if it simply doesn't exist. So there's no data to feed into that, which means that restrictions aren't progressing um, and it's often cited that this is the reason. But the other thing that's important to point out is the very start of the process is also proving a challenge. So the health and environmental concerns when we were in the EU came from a range of different agencies. So for example, it would have come from consumer groups or public health bodies, perhaps water companies might have noticed something, workers groups, as well as the policy leads and regulators or perhaps charities. And these would all feed in information now we do have a lot of these groups in uh, the UK, so we do have 
Um, here in Scotland, we've got SEPA, um, we've got the Environment Ag Agency, we do have public health bodies. Um, so there are a number of different organisations that could help um, either monitor, we could have universities, or might be aware of health and environmental concerns. But these groups haven't been given extra resource um, and extra responsibilities to identify those health and environmental concerns. So really at the very start of the process, we haven't set ourselves up to be able to identify uh, enough health and uh, identify health and environmental concerns um, to replicate what we were or to um, keep up with the number of chemicals on the market. So the very beginning of the process is proving an issue as well as once we get into the restriction suggestions and restriction proposals progressing um, being slowed down. So hopefully that gives you some um, idea of some of the processes and pitfalls in UK REACH with registration and with restriction of chemicals. So as Heather's already discussed, I'm just going to go over a couple of the points that could help us to start with a better approach and improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the process we have at the moment. So as Heather mentioned, one of the key problems that we are facing is a lack of resources throughout the restriction process. So for in order for us to keep up to date with the chemicals that are coming onto the market, we need to better resource these parts of the process. However, we still need to address the lack of data. So until we have a robust chemical regulation system set up in the UK, one of the ways of doing this would be to align with the EU data that's already in circulation and the, the restriction decisions that come from the EU. When we then have GB specific data, we can tailor our approaches to restrictions um, with that information once it's accessible. In the meantime, to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our, um, our approach, we can look at systems such as taking a grouping approach to chemical restrictions to help speed up restrictions and to prevent cases of regrettable substitution, where we replace one restricted chemical with another one with similar harmful characteristics, um, or starting to phase out harmful chemicals such as endocrine disrupting chemicals or persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals, which we know are harmful for human health and the environment. Um, so they should hopefully give us a good kickstart um, alongside many of the recommendations that FIDRA and other charities have put together in 12 key asks, which can be found on our website. <laughs>